Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, a warm welcome and thanks to delegates and all the speakers joining us today. Um, we realise everyone's schedules and workloads are extremely busy at the moment, so we really do appreciate your time and attendance here today. Hope you're going to find the session useful um, and really hope it helps to catalyse progress on adopting the local authority declaration on healthy weight in, in your areas. Next slide, please, Beth. So, um, my name is uh, Nicola Calder. I am programme lead at Food Active. And just before we start this morning's session, I'd just like to give you a little bit of information about who we are. Next slide, please, Beth. So Food Active, um, I'm sure most of you will already know this, is a healthy weight programme delivered by the Health Equalities Group and commissioned by local public health teams, NHS organisations, and Public Health England teams at both regional and national level. Food Act is one of two programmes delivered by the Health Equalities Group, which includes our sister organisation, Healthy Stadia. And Food Active focuses on advocacy, targeted interventions, research and strategic partnerships to drive forward policy calls. Originating in the northwest of England, Food Active supports local authorities across the region, both on an individual level, but also in taking a collaborative approach to promoting healthy weight. More recently, the Food Active programme has worked to support local authorities across England, from the North East, Yorkshire and Humber to the South West, and more recently, uh, colleagues in Southampton and Derbyshire, and helping to drive forward the Healthy Weight Agenda. So welcome to, to delegates this morning who are attending from across the regions. Next slide, please, Beth. So just in terms of some basic housekeeping, if we could ask if you could please mute your microphone to minimise any noise disruption and turn off video unless you're speaking. We will have time for question and answers after the main presentations this morning. So please pop any questions that you have in the chat function during the presentations and we'll come to those at the end uh, or respond in the chat. If you are tweeting today, please use the information on screen. Um, we will be recording the event and all presentations will be made available uh, and the recording after the event. Next slide, please, Beth. So just to offer um, an overview of the agenda today, um, I won't run through this in detail. Um, if you would like more information, please do take a look at the um, programme for today and there's further information around our speakers in the speaker biography. So I think we'll now move on to the first presentation of the morning. Um, and I'd like to introduce Dr. Alison Moore, who is Public Health Specialist at Lancashire County Council. And Alison will be speaking um, from a local authority perspective in terms of COVID inequalities and healthy weight. Thank you, Alison. Good morning to everybody. And uh, thank you, Nicola, for um, the invitation to come and actually speak today. Um, just wanting to check that you can just see my presentation there. Give us a nod if you can. Just take it back a touch. That's great. Thanks, um, Alison. Thank you. So the uh, the invitation actually was to our director of public health, Sakthi, um, who unfortunately can't can't be here today. Um, very busy man, obviously, at the moment. Um, so he um, has nominated me to come along and apologies if the, the presentation is a little dry. Uh, it really was just to set the scene for you. Um, and I'm, I'm fairly sure that it probably won't be telling you anything you're you're not aware of um but really just to try and contextualize it really for us within public health um so yes I, as nicola said i'm a, a public health specialist um i'm in sakthi's team and we have teams that work across all the different um subject areas within within public health I actually look after children and young people and health improvement. So responsible for our, our commissioning 
our program development um, of various uh, issues you can imagine with children and young people in particular it's a particularly wide remit so everything from health visiting school nursing vision screening speech and language development breastfeeding and i also look after all the food agenda um nhs health checks adult weight management children's obesity etc um so across lancashire over the um the pandemic unfortunately we we have seen um an, an exacerbation basically of our health inequalities that already existed um we have significant pockets where the the disadvantage really has really played out um very starkly as far as um covid19 uh, and an affected communities um disproportionately we have uh, experienced extreme challenge um, and huge amounts of loss unfortunately loss of life and they are due to a number of things really that social deprivation that disadvantage the health inequality being extremely wide in some of our areas for example somewhere like pendle where we have the um some of the poorest areas across Lancashire, but also some of the most affluent also. Um, all the, the social issues playing out, unfortunately, for us. So people who've lived in, in our deprived areas have had high diagnosis of COVID-19 and, and death, unfortunately, as well. Um, and actually in our most deprived areas, that mortality rate has been up to as much as double unfortunately um and that you know has also been shown to be even after adjustment of age sex region and ethnicity um that that um inequality has been been there in the death rate unfortunately the comorbidities certainly have had a an influence on this so people with underlying health conditions and uh, they were uh, in our lists of uh, vulnerable people, um, they are extremely more sensitive to COVID-19 and, and the risk of that respiratory infection, particularly, and also more likely to have a poorer outcome if they have had coronavirus, unfortunately. And we are seeing now reasonably high numbers um, of adults and children coming through with long COVID, which... Um, is a it can be extremely debilitating and uh, we are finding that people aren't able to go back to work because of it um and also that the the symptoms are quite wide ranging anything from arrhythmias and actually damage to the heart right through to someone being fatigued and and really not being able to to function not being able to get up and and carry out their normal daily life um, and everything in between really so it is a, a particularly difficult one um we are having some nhs response to that um but i think actually there's there's a wider public health impact that we will see start to play out, uh, out over the next few years there is evidence to suggest that um coronavirus is is heavily linked to people with cardiovascular disease lung disease and diabetes um, and that there is that strong relationship unfortunately with, with BMI particularly with our patients going into ICU um, and then unfortunately experience a higher rate of death so I've just put up a number of studies um, that have shown that really so I think certainly for this this presentation today really to highlight um, the, the very strong link between coronavirus and people with a high BMI or living with obesity. Um, very unfortunate, um, but actually it has brought the subject really up, um, up the rankings as far as a priority. Um, so it's, you know, it's something that I think that we we, we need to capitalize on really we need to take the opportunity we've um we have had 
more interest, shall we say, in the subject, certainly from elected members, etc., since coronavirus. Um, and I think certainly think there's been a nervousness across the population um, if people are overweight, um, starting to have a, a think about their lifestyle and potentially trying to get um, their weight lower. We do have a particularly serious prevalence in Lancashire, unfortunately, 67.4 of our adult population um, are living with obesity. And this is a couple of percent above our regional level and a couple of percent more above our national level. Um, and it, that is a huge number of people. The population of Lancashire is just over 1.5 million. So you can imagine that is a lot of people there. So we are going to truly to have to take a very public health approach to trying to address this. But I, I think that um, one of the most important issues for me is that we need to go about this without prejudice and that we need to be aware that actually we cannot give a, a middle class solution to our areas of, of deprivation and challenge. Um, and we need to be considerate about the amount of information that people can receive, or have the capacity to receive and to act upon. And actually their means of being able to act upon um, advice is, is extremely important. And we need to really have a, a reality check, if you like, about how we, we, we go about our business around trying to address this and, uh, and really trying to understand our communities, understand the lives that they lead and really understand what changes could be made. I often think, you know, over the, the certainly the last few years, we've, we've often wagged the finger and, and tried to push uh, uh, that, that middle-class solution really. And that, that's where we, we, um, we go terribly wrong, I think. So obesity is associated obviously with a really reduced life expectancy anyway and seriously linked to type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, liver and respiratory disease and cancer. And then we have a, a little chicken and egg situation with mental health um, It can impact on mental health, but also, also mental health can and, uh, and actually increase the risk of, of obesity anyway, or living with obesity. So I do think that, um, you know, we just need a rethink really and I do think the, um, the healthy weight declaration can help us certainly over in Blackburn with Darwin and the Pennine Langs region that have been running the Healthy Places Healthy Future program and we've seen huge strides there made as far as working with our elected members in particular bearing in mind that these are members of our public also um, and that they can actually create some um, avenues for us that we've we've perhaps not explored to the full at the moment. So certainly across Lancashire, we are in the process of planning system improvement as an ICS, an integrated care system, which for us is Lancashire and South Cumbria. We, um, we do have the Healthy Weight Declaration, we are signed up to that, but I think it's fair to say that certainly through the pandemic and, and in the, the couple of years previous that we really haven't capitalised on our uh, on utilising the declaration as we should. We've just had a, a cabinet um, shuffle around. So uh, again, a, an opportunity. Um, and certainly I will be looking over the next few years to be able to really make sure that we utilise it well. We have a tier two weight management commission in place with our district councils. That unfortunately was only signed just days before uh, we went into lockdown, unfortunately. So um, our providers are just in the process of getting going. And we have just received more monies from PHE to be able to just target that to our areas of deprivation as well, which has been really useful. We have a triple P programme, which is a parenting programme, a lifestyle module. And we are looking to um, roll this out across our early years provision. Um, trying to actually target children based on their par parents' weight. Um, so it doesn't really matter if um, the child isn't showing um, a high BMI centile 
um, at the time of seeing our health visitor between two and two and a half, but actually their, their parents' weight will be the trigger to the referral to, to Triple P. And just trying to make sure that we do that in a, um, a, a friendly diplomatic way so as not to put parents off really. We have incredible years run by our school nursing service, um, which is currently small numbers. So we are looking to increase the capacity of that. We are doing some work with colleagues across the authority who are responsible for the HALF programme, which is the holiday activity and food fund that we have from DFE. And as public health, we are just joining with that commission um, and filling in the term times with food and activity for five to eight year olds, trying to create community opportunity where children can come along with their family members, um, prepare food that's locally sourced and, and have a healthy meal and also play uh, as actively as possible. Um, and we're just trying to steer away a little from it being sport orientated, but very much around child-led play as much as we can. I do believe we have a gap um, of people living with obesity in pregnancy. And actually, we just need to really remind ourselves that the number one marker for childhood obesity is mum's preconceptual weight. So we are looking to do some targeted work with our midwifery services with that. And we really do let our teenagers down as far as weight management and, and whatever we want to call it. I mean, I, I feel the term is really inappropriate potentially for teenagers, um, but we have a significant gap there as far as um, any interventions, et cetera. I mentioned the Healthy Place, Healthy Future, which is the LGA funded childhood obesity trailblazer program going on in Pennine Lanks at the moment. Um, and that's seen some great results and some fabulous learning that I really do think that we can utilise across the rest of the county and the rest, the rest of the ICS. So um, a really good programme that's, um, you know, continued through the pandemic, which has been amazing, um, particularly to say that a lot of the parts of it um, were customer facing or uh, resident facing previously so you know, just entering into their third year now but um, but going great guns and as far as our commission within public health we have um, the public health grant and we are just looking at a, um, the way we commission and and who we commission and how we commission so we are really looking to try and, and, and use a, a marmot approach and really working on that targeted universalism that yes we will need universal services um, across our population very often but actually we will start to just hone down on those areas that really do need to where we need to address the cause of the cause um, and not just looking at the subject but actually really trying to understand how we can improve and help those communities um, that are um, facing the biggest challenges in public health. That's it from me. Thank you very much. Again, apologies, it's a little dry. Um, you've got some fabulous presentations coming up this morning um, with far nicer slides, but um, hopefully that just set the scene for you. Um, we are obviously still very much in the pandemic um, my team is on the COVID management desk as well as trying to do their, their regular jobs. So it, um, it is a very, very busy time for us. And, um, but finally, after 25 years in public health, I don't need to explain my job anymore, which is, is great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alison. Um, and thanks for giving us a helpful insight into uh, some of the challenges that have been brought by the, the pandemic and how this has uh, impacted on inequalities. And I think it's been really interesting to hear that elected members are, are taking more of an interest in this area too. So thank you for that presentation. And, and we will have time for, for questions for Alison later in the morning. Um, so if, if I could now move on to our next speaker um, and introduce Nicola Corrigan. 
Um, Nicola is the Healthy Places and Sustainable Communities Programme Lead at Public Health England for the North East and Yorkshire region. And uh, Nicola will be talking us through a regional perspective for the Healthy Weight Declaration uh, in the context of COVID and the National Obesity Strategy. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Beth. I'm just trying to share my screen, so I will try again because uh, I can't see my, there it is. Couldn't see my presentation when I first clicked up. Um, so if you can just let me know if you can see that, that would be great. That's great, Nicola. We can all see that. Thanks very much, Beth. Okay, so um, as I said, thank you very much to um, uh, Food Active for inviting me to talk to you this morning. I'm just going to give um, a little bit of an overview of the impact of COVID and introduce the National Obesity Strategy and some new government funding, um, but also talk about the regional perspective for a healthy weight declaration that we've been working on in Yorkshire and Humber for about the last two or three years now with the uh, obvious 18 month COVID hiatus in the middle. So. We know that before we had COVID, we had inequalities um, in obesity, and we know that particularly for children, we had a deprivation inequality, and also for Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups, we had um, a, an inequality in um, obesity. What happened when we saw COVID is we saw that that also um, came out in disparities and risks, and we saw Black, Asian and minority ethnic populations also have an inequality in the impact of COVID. We then looked at some research around COVID outcomes and saw that excess weight uh, was having a worse impact on people who had, a, who had COVID, um, with some of them having a four times risk increase of being uh, admitted to ICUs um, as a result of uh, contracting COVID. This then led to the new obesity strategy for adults and children. And up until summer last year, we'd only really looked at childhood obesity um, from a government strategic approach. This now included adults to be able to start to reduce some of those inequalities that we saw before COVID, but also a reflection on the fact that we saw people having those worse outcomes when they, um, when they developed COVID. So this has now led to um, a massive influx of government funding to support healthier weight. Um, and yes, the majority of it is around adult weight management services, and this is across the NHS and local authorities. But there is also some uh, money for child weight management services. There is some funding available for research, primarily into early years and looking at what works to support parents and their um, small children and infants around this. There was the 15 million put into the Better Health campaign, and this looked at people being more active, looked at their mental health, looked at them eating a healthier diet and stopping smoking, all as a response to um, the COVID pandemic. And also there are a package of incentives that are being worked on um, from governments that are still to be um, developed. But all in all, this was about £100 million pounds worth uh, of funding. And it's been uh, developed to support health and local authorities to address um, weight gain and weight management in our population. So as Alison had pointed out earlier, we've uh, funded local authorities to commission tier two adult behaviour change programmes. This is initially for a year, but one of the things that we're particularly looking at is how they reach those groups and populations seldom heard or seldom attending what we would call a traditional weight management programme. So we have some examples in Yorkshire and Humber of targeted weight management services for people with mental health issues, uh, for people with learning disabilities, for people from Black, Asian, minority ethnic groups, and also for um, some teenagers um, and young adults. So we're looking at those age 18 to 25 with some of those programmes. There's the piloting of children and weight families tier two programmes that are linked to the NCMP and how we can build on those um, brief interventions with school nurses and uh, other health support staff to support families and children. 
the local ICSs, so that's the integrated care systems that you will all have in uh, your local areas, are leading the rollout of the digital weight management programme. This is a programme that's funded for people who have a BMI of plus 30, but also have a comorbidity of either diabetes or hypertension. And in that programme, there's also a postpartum pilot to help um, women who have recently given birth uh, also look at their weight, but in a safe and uh, safe and structured weight loss. The NHS, through its Children and Young People's Transformation Programme, is commissioning um, a service for children and young people around complications related to excess weight. And this is where children and young people are having uh, need other surgery, but actually their weight gain is causing issues um, with, and concerns around how that surgery can take place. And we're going to be taking part in the North East in Yorkshire in a review to understand how uh, Tier 3 is currently commissioned and delivered across CCGs. And also as part of that um, review, we're going to be looking at how we can support Tier 4 services to ensure bariatric recovery is in line with other elective surgery recovery, which we know there is um, a huge backlog as a result of the COVID restrictions. And finally, there's going to be a national obesity audit taking place starting later this year and concluding in 2024. And that's across uh, NHS and it will also include um, local authority services so we can get a better picture of um, what's going on across our populations. But one of the things that I wanted to talk about today was not just talk about um, the government funding that was going in, but also how weight management fits into a whole systems approach. And this is where I feel the Healthy Weight Declaration can really support that understanding of the wider um, implications around uh, the wider effects of uh, obesity and what's needed to tackle it. So you can see in the bottom left hand corner, providing access to weight management support is just one part of um, I know, a whole systems approach. We also are looking at planning a healthier food environment, um, school and childcare settings, increasing healthy food consumptions, along with creating workplaces and increasing active travel and planning. And you can see that for many of these, uh, many of these things, the local authority is the place to be able to um, support that development, particularly around planning and creating an environment and increasing travel uh, that, promotes, uh, active, uh, that promotes physical activity. So one of the things that we've been doing in Yorkshire and Humber is that we have been taking a regional approach to uh, the Healthy Weight Declaration. As I said, three years ago, the 15 local authorities signed up to a project that would see them all signed up to the director of uh, the Declaration of Healthy Weight. Prior to COVID, we had four local authorities signed up and we had two working towards it. I since know that um, we've had another two start to uh, develop their contact with their councillors um, since I wrote this presentation. So that we're hoping that by the time we've finished um, in the next few months, we'll have eight in total. Um, it's having an impact at a regional level. So we've since uh, developed our healthier food advertising project, which is looking at how the local authorities can support each other to develop common policies to reduce unhealthy advertising which we know with the announcement later today around the junk food advertising restrictions um, going online and for other media before 9pm by 2023. This is really important because um, if the advertising can no longer take place online, it will need to move somewhere and it will most probably move into the unregulated um, out of home area so we think we're a little bit ahead of the game here trying to develop healthy advertising policies um, for our local authorities and the other impact it's having at a local level so one of our local authorities leads um, you may have heard on previous food active conferences have been working on a healthier vending machine pilot that um, research has now now finished and that's been um, has influenced their procurement uh, contracting uh, 
strategy. We also have a sustainable food strategy development coming across through York, and we have a whole authority approach um, to the healthy weight declaration taking place uh, across Kirklees. And I think Barnsley are also thinking of um, having a whole authority approach. So that was just a little bit of sharing how we in Yorkshire and Humber have used the Declaration on Healthy Weight to really drive our whole systems approach to um, reducing obesity and improving um, outcomes for some of our uh, poorer and uh, inequal populations facing inequalities. And I'd just like to hand back to Beth now. Thanks, Nicola. Um, that was a really interesting presentation and, and I think useful to consider um, today's agenda with the context of whole systems approach and, and some of what you were talking about in terms of a strategic approach nationally to uh, adults to address unhealthy weight. So thank you. And again, we'll take questions for Nicola a little later in the morning. Um, so I'll just move swiftly on now to our next presentation from Dr. Robin Island, Director of Research at Food Active, who will be taking us through how the Healthy Weight Declaration can assist with COVID-19 recovery. Thank you, Robin. Good morning. Sorry, I'm just looking for the icons on my screen. Right, hopefully everybody can see everything. Uh, thanks very much for um, enabling me to speak today. And I'm, I'm conscious of quite a large audience from uh, across, I was going to say England, but I think that there may be some Scottish colleagues as well, so across the UK. So um, I'm aware really there's almost two audiences um, here. There, there are people, there are people from authorities who have already adopted and are very much uh, as, as we've heard already from Alison talking about how they can take things forward but there are also authorities that are, are contemplating or approaching a, a adoption so uh, forgive me if I kind of lean both ways as it were to try and involve um, both sets of audiences to, to consider how they can use a healthy weight declaration or how they can take it forward. So forgive me for very, very quickly touching on some of the issues um, for those who are looking to adopt. Um, I won't take a time with that and people who have used the declaration will already be aware of what they're for, but they provide an opportunity through strategic leadership, unquestionably around awareness, and they can drive activity. And I think um, particularly Alison's presentation, but also Emma's and Ravita's afterwards will um, highlight some of the same points. Um, very much uh, following on from Nicola, but also from Alison, just to give an indication of how the declaration has developed. And again, I, I won't take long on this, but what is uh, very obvious is uh, in February 2020, Pr Bristol City Council um, adopted with, with uh, quite a fanfare and uh, well done to them and quite exciting some of the work that's happened afterwards. But of course, they were the last uh, authority to declare and we all know the reasons why, and I think today is very about mindful of the, the pressure on work that came through very strongly in, in Alison's presentation in particular, but also the overview and, and uh, as Nicola's just been talking about in terms of government with an increased focus around obesity, I think. So perhaps some reflections and learning now both for those authorities that have adopted, but those that are looking to get there. Um, it takes time to get there. And uh, I was talking to colleagues in Barnsley with Nicola earlier this week and to talk about how long it takes. It does take time, and uh, particularly with the pandemic and also mindful of the workload that we talk about. Also, each authority will take their own path. And I, I think we'll, we'll hear that across the morning. Consultation is critical and shouldn't be hurried. And again, a message that we will hear. It's the whole council approach. It isn't, public health is a facilitator, if you like, but the declaration provides a golden thread that provides to a number of the um, policies and programs that local authorities are able to do. Um, people are very happy to share experiences and support each other. Um, today is all about that, isn't it? And I think my entire experience over the years of working with the declaration has confirmed that and uh, it, 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 it's great to be part of public health with that because people are very willing to. We talked about the, the challenges around COVID-19. Um, perhaps we can we can start to consider the opportunities and I think both Nicola and, and, and um, uh, Alison have referred to that. Is there an opportunity? So forgive me using the government's term, but is there an opportunity to build back better? Um, 
one of the things that I'm sort of very much aware of is that uh, across the pandemic, there's been a sort of presentation of health versus wealth. And right from the beginning, I remember the, the, the councillor uh, leading the process for Blackpool saying, you can't separate them. And we really need to have learned that. It, it's not a binary choice and it can't be a binary choice. All the time we're having to, to reflect upon these issues. And I think this has come through really strongly, the importance of public health. I love that from Alison where she said, I don't know after however many years it was working public health, I don't know how to explain my job. <laughs> well, if we can't uh, explain to people why public health is important now, we never will. So that's unquestionably an opportunity. We've also talked about inequalities and, um, Alison, you, you very uh, unfair to yourself describe your presentation as unfair, but some of some of the words you used were, were, were brilliant. Um, uh, health inequalities and proportionate universalism. We need to understand our communities. That's that's a term you use. Um, we mustn't be going around with a middle class solution. I love that. We, we kind of probably all know what we mean about that, but it's not about finger wagging. We have to go about it without prejudice, exactly as you said. So I think that's really important and that fits in with the appropriate messaging. And goodness me, we've all had enough to take on, haven't we, as individuals? And there's been an awful lot of, well, it's somebody else's fault, isn't it? It's always your fault, isn't it? So how do we take on some of those lessons to some of those statistics presented earlier in terms of what can you do as local authorities what can we do to support our most disadvantaged communities so um i do i do think there are opportunities i hope that public health is is valued um as, as we're saying and is coming through most strongly um, much more awareness. I like the point, and I've heard this from other other people. So I can remember quoting a colleague from Lee sometime back saying the declaration enabled us to um, uh, uh, talk to people who haven't been able to do that before. And having had the uh, advantage of uh, seeing both Emma's and Ravita's presentations after mine, also very much aware of that uh, about the opportunity to perhaps engage with people um, you've not been able to before because of the pandemic. Very much the link between obesity and COVID is recognised, come through very, very clearly with Alison uh, and Nicholas slides and, and the inequalities and the, very much the disadvantage faced by our, our uh, most disadvantaged communities. There's got to be a positive message here about supporting a healthier environment, um, which is um, uh, it, it, it's, it's much broader than purely what we eat or um, uh, the kind of green space it's it's right across what we can do so this is about what a council can do to provide leadership to work with fellow organization and as 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 the quote on there it, it's health that's a real wealth and perhaps we've all got an understanding of that given what we've all had to face as individual and families but across communities very important, the local accountability and ownership. Um, this came through in Alison's presentation. This will come through later in the next two presentations in terms of elected members appreciating that responsibility um, and very much ownership of the declaration. I've talked about engaging with local communities. Um, I've gone through quickly because I'm very much aware of the time. Um, I want to make sure there's enough discussion or enough time to hear the next two presentations, but also for those of you who can stay on for a wee bit of discussion after some, some questions. So uh, thank you very much. And I'll hand back to Nicola at this point. Thank you, Robin. Thanks for your presentation. Again, really helpful to consider the opportunities post-COVID and um, to move forward with the Healthy Weight Agenda. Um, and we're now going to um, move forward to the next session, which I think moves on really well um, from, from Robin's in terms of um, local authority perspectives um, and, and we have two presentations one from an authority who had previously been looking to implement um, the declaration prior to COVID and another authority who is kind of just embarking on that journey so I'd like to start by uh, formally introducing Emma Gibson's presentation Emma is programme lead at public health um, in Gateshead Council unfortunately Emma can't be with us today so she has shared a recording of her presentation um, again, any questions for Emma, please do put those in the chat and we will be able to forward them on to her um, after today's session.
Hi, I'm Emma Gibson. I'm a programme lead within the Gateshead Public Health team and I lead on healthy weight and wider determinants across the life course. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the journey in Gateshead that we've been on with our local authority healthy weight declaration, some of the opportunities and challenges apart as part of this. So in 2019, this is when Gates had really started the healthy weight um, journey um, in terms of the healthy weight declaration. We got off to a great start and Gates said was very much committed to making a difference in the area of healthy weight and shifting the mindset um, to a holistic approach across all our systems. In Gates said, like many other areas, we know that high levels of obesity um, and the burden kind of falls hardest on those from deprived areas. So really for us, the Healthy Weight Declaration, the opportunities that this brought came at a great time. We'd just done a DPH report in 2019. It was very much focused on uh, people living with obesity and how societal changes over recent decades have really exasperated our risk of living with obesity. Uh, and very much the focus was that we move away um, focused on obesity um, created by just lifestyle choices solely and instead recognise um, the additional components um, and that obesity is really a result of environmental and um, social factors, economic and things like political pressures as well. We've done lots of work within Gateshead with our overview and scrutiny committee and members there focusing on a whole system approach and really trying to build the case that um, within the council that we were in an influential position to lead transformational change. And Gates said it was signed up to a system approach, uh, which was really consistent with the council's ambition to make Gateshead a place where everyone thrives. As a local authority, we were very much working to kind of the PHE materials and local government association kind of guidance and support for whole systems working. We'd done five local workshops with community and voluntary sector um, and our partners, and we're very much kind of in the action phase. We've mapped out our local systems and we'll look at kind of some of our priorities as well. We have really good, good partnership working um, within the area and lots of good work. Um, some of it is um, reflected in our supplementary planning document, uh, very much working with planning colleagues uh, where we successfully use this to kind of control the proliferation of hot food takeaways in, our, in areas with high levels of childhood obesity as well. So we were really kind of keen to build on some of this work and the next kind of natural progression felt like the Healthy Weight Declaration to re reflect some of this wider uh, system working as well. We'd also seen, you know, colleagues within the Northwest and some fantastic and innovative work that they'd done on their journey as well. So we were enthused and kind of the momentum was building for starting that journey with kind of the declaration as well. We'd also started a Healthy Weight Alliance group, which was chaired um, by our health and wellbeing lead um, within the council as well. We had a range of different partners across the system. So we're at kind of the right stage for overseeing some of the Healthy Weight Declaration um, commitments as well as part of this. So 2020 was the year that things came to a little bit of a halt, um, probably from me. And over the summer months, there was definitely a refocus within public health um, and energies and skills kind of were diverted from sort of more proactive wider determinants work to more reactive and dealing very much with the emergency response from the local authority um, to COVID. My work was partly working in a shielding hub, so providing emergency food aid food aid parcels uh, for members of, for our communities. Um, and then this really intensified um, as a kind of the pandemic went on to working five days a week um, just on COVID response with, with schools, so identifying positive cases, supporting around close contacts. Um, and it felt very much kind of a, a new role in terms of we were badged as kind of these health protection experts. Um, we knew the guidance inside and out, but we're dealing with numerous cases, um, you know, each day with kind of the, with the schools as well. And it was really challenging, I think, even just to kind of the headspace to consider anything outside of this area of COVID at the minute. And there was a real kind of want and desire and a little bit of frustration that you wanted to get kind of back to your old role. And especially, I think, because healthy weight, you know, it was so topical. The evidence base was coming out in terms of the, the risks um, within kind of increased um, weight and for um, certain um, certain groups as well within within our communities as well. But it felt that we were very much kind of immersed within kind of the, the COVID world. 
So 2021 was very much the restart year for us to get back on track with our healthy weight declaration and really kind of reinvigorate and make sure we were building on the momentum that we'd gathered. Healthy weight was very much part of the COVID recovery plans and obviously it was very much at the forefront of the discussions on recovery um, and looking at the impact on COVID for children and adults across the life course. And coming back to the agenda, it was a bit of a, a changed landscape that, you know, there was organisations I've worked with previously that weren't there. There was staff that had been kind of furloughed as well. Um, so it was very much kind of refocusing to see kind of where we were with the agenda uh, and very much, I suppose, that the need within our communities hadn't changed. It just kind of exasperated existing, uh, existing kind of conditions prior to COVID as well. We got Healthy Weight Alliance back on track um, with our um, health and wellbeing lead chairing that and thought we could kind of focus in on some of the, the priorities and look at sort of that COVID recovery and looked at areas like the active travel and carbon reduction um, as part of that agenda. It was very much, um, I thought we could build on the new partnerships that we developed within COVID. So All right, it's been a really, really challenging um, time for everyone, but I think there's lots of opportunities as well. So we were able to um, get into our schools really easily, was sometimes a little bit more difficult to get to the right person, but because we had those relationships and we were dealing with the schools on a daily basis, you know, public health would ring up and we would get straight through to their head teacher, which was kind of unheard of. Lots of opportunities kind of with other organisations going forward in terms of, I think, just trust built up and um, recognition and realisation what actually public health do as well and, and mutual respect uh, for organisations as well. And I think for me as well, a lot of work had been sitting within the office, right, and strategies, policies, and all right, we tried to be informed by our community, but very much working in one of the shielding hubs had very much brought it to the forefront in, in terms of kind of, um, I suppose, people's experience of COVID and that lived experience and some of the real challenging times that they were going through and struggles with family as well. So very much a kind of a time to refocus and the next stage we are looking at is kind of um, going to do some of our consultation events, which we had to kind of cancel from March last year on our journey is really kind of regrouping and looking at some of our um, local priorities from our Healthy Weight Alliance, but also some of the consultation events that we will be holding um, over the next couple of months as well. Okay, thank you to Emma for her presentation. Um, I'm very conscious of time and um, I'd like to ensure we have time for question and answers. So if we could move swiftly now to the last presentation in this session, and I'd like to warmly welcome um, Ravita Tahim, who is Senior Public Health Practitioner at Southampton City Council. And Ravita will be presenting Southampton's journey to adopting the declaration. Thank you, Ravita. Trying to share my screen. Uh, right. I seem to have lost my file. So I don't know whether you've got it there, Beth, to share. Yeah, I can I can get it on for you if you prefer, Rivita. Thank, thank you. No worries, yeah, just one just, second. It doesn't seem to have shown up. should be just coming up now yeah that's brilliant well that's happening so yeah thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this uh conference um and forum so um i'm ravita team i'm a senior public health practitioner at southampton city council and i lead on healthy weight and i have a, a real focus on tackling childhood obesity and that's my specialist interest um, so and that's really where our journey started, really, um, and that's been the driver for adopting the Healthy Wet Declaration in uh, Southampton. Um, so just to provide you with some context, if you move to the next slide, please. Um, childhood obesity rates in Southampton are similar to the England average in terms of year. Our um, 
and, and levels have remained stable over time. But for year six, our levels are significantly higher than the England average and are increasing. And in 2019, we estimated that between 13,000 and 13,500 of our two to seven year olds were either overweight and obese. And this is of a population um, of 45,000 to uh, 17 year olds. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the inequalities within within uh, Southampton, um, as in other areas of England, um, it's very clear that uh, childhood obesity is clearly higher amongst the most deprived communities compared to the least deprived communities. And that pattern has been consistent in Southampton over time. And the most recent data shows that um, levels are 1.8 times higher in our most deprived communities uh, in Southampton. So that really, and, and those patterns and that, and that widening inequality over time, has really made us think about how we can raise a profile of childhood obesity within our city. So back in 2017, um, 18, what we did do is we developed a, a public health led plan with local partners. And that was more of an action plan about how we were gonna shift from an individual uh, focus on behavior change to a more citywide uh, environmental focus on changing behaviour and that was um, swiftly followed by a director of public health annual report and it seemed to have done the trick because in 2019 our scrutiny manager at Southampton City Council came to us to say that the overview and scrutiny management committee were interested in doing a scrutiny inquiry into tackling childhood obesity. And that was a real starting point for us to think about how we can address obesity and childhood obesity across the council. So if you uh, move to the next slide, please. So our scrutiny inquiry um, into tackling childhood obesity started in October. It ran over five sessions um, and they were evidence gathering sessions um, in inviting local academics, local providers and, and other organisations to really set the scene and provide a context for tackling childhood obesity. And I think importantly for the local um, declaration on healthy weight, we invited local authorities who um, were, uh, you know, also, had, uh, in our view, made great strides to address childhood obesity, but also had adopted the Healthy Weight Declaration and then could come to our councillors, could come to our scrutiny inquiry panel and um, present on their experiences and, their, and the work that they'd done in their city. And I think that was really a key step in getting the Healthy Weight Declaration on the agenda at the council in Southampton. Um, just to, to cut a long story short, um, the inquiry came up with 16 recommendations and they were approved by Cabinet last December. And the inquiry was delayed and put back a little bit because of COVID. Um, but there were pros and cons, if you like. So the fact that it happened during COVID really provided an opportunity for councillors to express how important it was, how urgent it was to address the issue. However, on the other hand, because of res resources being redirected to dealing with COVID and, and the expectation that that will be the case going forward, the councillors and, and the cabinet recommended a phased approach to implementation for the recommendations of the in scrutiny inquiry. So some of the recommendations could be adopted and, and started straight away, whereas for other recommendations, there was a pause um, at, in the on the proviso that we could find funding and resource to, to do those recommendations or to, to undertake those recommendations in the future. Um, next slide, please. So I'm not going to go through the 16 recommendations that came from our scrutiny inquiry, but more but broadly, what we plan to do was address the environment, um, particularly the uh, focus on, on the food environment, because with physical activity, we are quite strong in Southampton. The next one was really to engage with local settings and build on uh, work that we're already doing in schools and early years. And, and third, and, and I think probably the most important one was to really develop a strong strategic ambition at political oversight and governance in terms of adopting a system-wide approach, adopting the Healthy Weight Declaration and other programmes such as the Sustainable Food Places Award. Next slide please. 
So in terms of the local authority declaration on healthy weight and what's, what that's done for us so far, so we, we started work um, properly on it in February this year, and it has provided us with a framework to um, include work that we were already, already planning, but really to uh, uh, enable us to think about additional work that we could do um, in view of the scrutiny inquiry and in view of the, the, the renewed commitment and the commitment to um, the Healthy Weight Declaration. So for strategic leadership, there was a, a very clear support as part, uh, from Cabinet um, for the recommendations for tackling childhood obesity. But what we now need to do is get a more visible support for um, adopting the Healthy Weight Declaration in the city. From a commercial determinants perspective, we are undertaking work to develop local guidance on limiting promotion of high fat sugar salt foods um, from our, our comms team uh, and the promotions that they do. And for our health uh, promoting infrastructure, we are in the process of recruiting a public health planner to support the development of our local plan. And from an organisational perspective, we are embedding healthy eating and the aspirations of the Healthy Weight Declaration as part of our local um, contracts work and include it in our Social Value Act for, for, for local council contracts. So next slide, please. In terms of personal reflections, what we have done in Southampton, as I understand that many councils have done in, in, um, in England, is, is use the local democratic infrastructure to get engagement from political leaders with obesity, with the Health Weight Declaration and with childhood obesity. And so what the process did do was secure that political engagement and it helped to gain cross-party consensus consensus on the recommendations and that's been really important because in Southampton this year we changed administration from a Labour administration to a Conservative administration and what the inquiry also did for us was provide a, a platform, a really powerful platform for having a conversation. Um, so uh, there are numerous occasions where myself and um, our consultant leads have started a conversation on last year we did a scrutiny inquiry into tackling childhood obesity and cabinet approved x y and z and so that really has helped to incentivize action. What it doesn't guarantee, as, as I explained earlier, is, is funding for um, delivering some of the recommendations and it doesn't guarantee political oversight and commitment beyond the inquiry. So that's some learning for us and something I, I, maybe others can learn from in, in that in get, getting that political commitment and that ongoing engagement does require continued work uh, and, and nurturing of, of, of political leaders. And then the platform that it does provide to have that conversation will be time limited. So, so we will need to act fast to get as much done as in, in as short a time as possible. Next slide, please. So this is um, wh when I was invited to speak, Robin asked me to, do, to quickly just provide some insight into my research. So I'm also a PhD student um, looking at local government decision making into um, tackling childhood obesity. And I found this framework on political commitment for nutrition especially helpful. And it may be helpful for you when you're taking forward the Healthy Weight Declaration. So this framework developed by Philip Baker and Green Hawks and others outlined five types of political commitment. Um, the first one is rhetorical commitment, where political leaders talk about how important it is to tackle an issue. But what they also found is that that doesn't necessarily lead to an operational commitment um, and money to actually change things. And the next type of commitment is the institutional commitment where the issue is embedded in policy and then operational commitment where the money is forthcoming to implement the changes. Embedded commitment is when other departments are indirectly working towards the agenda and system wide commitment relies on the other types of commitment being in place, but it really means, um, it, to my understanding, business as usual. So as the problem evolves, the issue evolves, then the responses evolve accordingly. So for us in Southampton, I think what I need to do it, and what we need to do as a city is think about where we are currently in terms of the rhetorical and institutional commitment and moving beyond that to a more embedded and system wide commitment to, to really fully tackle obesity and childhood obesity in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Evita. Uh, really, really insightful presentation and 
helpful for us to try and understand the framework for political commitment. Um, but, but in terms of both presentations, um, really valuable to understand the uh, local approach in the context of COVID. So thank you. Thanks to both our speakers. So um, we are going to take some time now for question and answers um, to our panel speakers this morning. I've noticed there are one or two in the chat um, directed at Nicola. So I will take those in, in a couple of moments. I know Ravita will need to leave us shortly. So could I ask just in the first instance, if we if we have any questions for um, um, for Ravita and uh, if you want to unmute yourself and um, direct your questions um, to the speakers. I know certainly, Rivita, um, from, from my perspective, I wondered if you might have any um, advice or, or key learning points at this stage um, of the process on um, the democratic process and, and perhaps how this can be harnessed to progress the Healthy Weight Declaration. I know you, you, you've obviously touched on that within your presentation, but um, any, any more sort of advice or, or tips? Um, so I think I can... Uh... I can share my comparison. So a few years ago, we did develop a local plan <coughs> independent of the democratic process. And I think that did work to some extent to raise the issue, to raise a profile, but really to get engagement and buy-in from local uh, other departments um, within the council and also externally, it's really important to use the processes that we have at our disposal within the council. And they're, they're not fully at our disposal because we, we require local councillors to, to take the lead and to be interested enough to to request those but actually when that comes available to us I think it's um it's, it's a gift really to get um more political engagement from political leaders even if it's time limited but also um raise the issue with all, within our other democratic um opportunities for example the health and well-being board and, and cabinet member briefings and all that sort of thing I think the, the the process of the scrutiny inquiry does serve to raise a profile um, and does serve as a platform to have that conversation. And I think with something like this, that, that is quite powerful. So from my experiences um, of doing both things, um, I think it's really important to use the democratic processes when we can, especially within a local government, local political context. Thank you. Um, and we've also a question from um, Ben Caulfield. Um, Ben's asking, is it possible to share more de detail on Southampton scrutiny inquiry? Ben, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that a little more. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. So we're probably, uh, obviously we're a much, much smaller council, very, very different than Southampton. So from Hyman Council, um, we're a lower tier um, authority in Lancashire. But we um, are likely going down the scrutiny route to the um, healthy weight declaration. So, I was, yeah, I was just interested in um, maybe finding a bit more information about uh, Southampton's inquiry. Oh, I'm not sure if Ravita's screen. Oh, I think you're back. Sorry, I completely missed those questions. I, I've lost, I lost contact there for a bit. So the question, the question was from Ben, um, who's particularly interested in the the scrutiny inquiry. Um, Ben's from Hindburn Council and um, looking to take a similar approach, um, but probably working on on a slightly smaller scale than Southampton City Council. Yeah, that's right. Um, so what what helped uh, me in Southampton, I don't know whether you've got a scrutiny inquiry manager, but they were invaluable in helping to shape the inquiry and to shape the report afterwards. But what, what happened in Southampton is that public health had really could steer the journey and could steer the ship in terms of getting that inquiry, in terms of who we invited to the inquiry, who presented, um, uh, and then how the recommendations were shaped. So from that perspective, in the background, um, it was 
quite a powerful opportunity for us. I think the, the challenge will be um, as you get, you know, a concentrated period of time where you get that engagement and, and politicians are all in, um, certainly the scrutiny inquiry, but then it's keeping that going um, afterwards. Thanks, Ravita, and, and just to formally thank you again um, for your time this morning, because I, I know you do have to leave us now, so thanks for that. Um, I think there was a couple of questions for Nicola. Um, one was um, from Arfan Hussein in relation to um, the approach to working across the ICS with a, a whole systems approach. Arfan, do you want to, to say any more about that? Um, I'm okay with that, mainly because Nicola gave a fantastic answer already in the chat. <laughs> okay. I mean, I can, I can, I'm more than happy to elaborate. Really, I think ICSs have got a really important role here to play, um, either with local, working across their local authority systems, working across their health systems, if they're adopting healthy weight um, declarations. Um, and also, as I directed our fund, there is... Um, we're seeing emerging in Yorkshire and Humber um, whole place approaches to the healthy weight declaration. So we've got the Kirklees healthy weight declaration, which includes uh, the local authority, health partners and all other partners um, in that. So I think uh, ICSs have got a vital role in systems leadership around this whole area. Thank you. Thanks for that, Nicola. Um... Just, just conscious of time, so I think what we might do is just make a slight tweak to the agenda and, and I think perhaps what we'll do is continue this as our, our Q&A session um, and Beth and I can sort of um, clo close this morning's session um, with our presentation at the end. So um, I will hand over to Robin, who I know is going to help facilitate, um, but I do have um, one final question here at the moment from um, the audience this morning and that's from Stephen, Stephen Carter. He'd be interested to know how all speakers are evaluating the outcomes of their approaches to the healthy weight declaration in both the short and the long term and, and that might be something that, that Robin can um, add value to and, and Alison you might like to come in there as well. Okay sorry Nicola you, you're you're asking now if we sort of start to move towards an open forum discussion and then we'll take your presentation at the end okay no that's absolutely fine so um it would be good to sort of broaden things out and uh, uh we will finish shortly with actually how food actually can specifically support you as well but i know some of you will have questions i'm sort of dodging that question quickly in terms of evaluation but i'll go back to it um, I'm just remembering one that came up earlier and I should reinforce while well, we've still got most people on. We will share the slides afterwards. Um, I can't remember who asked and my apologies for that, but the, the slides will be presented. Please also do contact us and people are wanting to contact each other. We could introduce you afterwards if you if you found one of the presentations really helpful and you, you'd like to follow up. So the question was, was, was about evaluation, um, which I think is, is, is important. So uh, Food Active do provide some support within that. And I think different authorities are taking quite different approaches. I think what we're really um, very conscious of uh, is the importance. And I, I really did like that slide of Revita's. I know she's gone sort of, we, we very much want to get beyond the rhetorical and institutional commitment and make it um, operational embedded. I, I think that's a, a very, very nice way of putting it rather than just having things stuck on a shelf. Alison, I can see you there. Were you waving? Did you want to come in or was it, were you just moving and you caught my eye? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Sorry. I was just moving, yeah. <laughs> Don't there. worry. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm, I'm sort of looking across. Um, can I ask other authorities who want to contribute? There's been a lot coming through on chat. The, the, the other question that, that came up, I think, um, which I noticed Emma replied about, is this for people who have, have adopted as well, how do you keep things fresh? So I, I think there's, there's a double question there. So one about how you're evaluating and, and secondly, how are you keeping things fresh? Could we maybe ask one or two other authorities who might like to, 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 to come in there and, and talk? We've got quite a lot. Or Alison, yourself from Lancashire or something. Um, any, anybody else who'd like to come in there? Emma, you replied to one of those and I can, I can see you on our screen from Leeds. Emma, did you want to contact, uh, contribute? I know you've been very active in Leeds. Uh, and it does some great work. Yeah, I suppose I'm just kind of building on from the point that I made. Um, 
because we have a steering group that's got representation from across the different council directorates, we can kind of call upon them as ambassadors within their teams to be able to kind of raise the healthy weight declaration. And I suppose the next step for us is kind of reconnecting back to the more strategic structures, going back to our health and wellbeing board and kind of utilising the power of that steering group to make sure that it continues to be on the radar. We've also done some kind of really good work just across our staff team so we've run a staff survey um, year on year about the healthy weight declaration just to keep it in the wider staff's minds and also made sure that the general council website includes a link to the healthy weight declaration and kind of asked questions about how the healthy weight declaration can be embedded in our work around procurement and other um, objectives like that. Thanks, Emma. Uh, that's interesting, actually, putting on the on the council website. I'm not sure how common that is, but that, that's really interesting, actually. Um, there, there's a question come in, I've noticed from Kate Green at Rotherham, talking about the Kirk Lees uh, whole place declaration. I know Barnsley are also um, uh, 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 looking at that same approach. Um, it's something that Kirk Lees have done and other areas have done quite early on. So I think it's um, it, it, it's an interesting approach. So this is where it isn't just the local authority uh, making the declaration, it's involving partners um, as well. Nicola, do you want to comment? Because obviously that also links in with the partnership pledge that we haven't particularly um, taken, uh, discussed today particularly. Nicola Cole, yeah. that is, yeah. Thanks, yes. Nicola, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Robin. Um, I suppose, yeah, just, just picking up on that point about evaluation as well. Obviously, we, we do have a suite of resources that are available for people and um, who, who are implementing the declaration and, um, we, you know, evaluation, audit, monitoring. Um, there are a number of resources available to support local authorities with that. So do contact us if, if you'd like more details around some of that. Um, and, and as Robin has um, mentioned, we have um, since launched a, a partner pledge, which um, allows um, a range of organisations who are working in partnership with the local authority um, uh, to sign up to support the local authority in, in um, achieving their their commitments and, and supporting the healthy weight agenda. So again, that, that's another resource that, that, that's available. And again, we can we can share details of that. Okay, thanks very much, Nicola. Um, I don't want to draw this session out too long because I'm, as we've all said, we're so aware of time. There's some really good stuff going on there around um, in the chat, which I'm desperately trying to read. Um, uh, Kate's just come through with another one. I'll, I'll ask um, Nicola if you can respond to that in a moment. Uh, Nicola, uh, I'm, I'm really I'm going all over the place. Sorry, Nicola Corrigan just uh, commented to me. Oh, which question? For, yeah, so Nicola Calder, you will come back on the NHS declaration in a moment if, if I can ask you to take that question from Kate in a minute when I ask you to come to your presentation. Um, I, I, I tweeted a moment ago, um, I'm just really excited that we've had inputs across England today really. We've heard from Lancashire, we've heard from Yorkshire and Humber, we've heard from Gateshead and we've heard from Southampton and, and we can see the commonality but also sometimes there's slight subtleties in, in approaches and, and how much COVID has really impacted upon everyone uh, of, of course and particularly public health workload. I'm just going to ask if there are any more questions specifically at this point? And uh, if they're not, I will go on to Nicola and Bess concluding presentation, but don't let me chase you. I'm desperately trying to read the chat at the same time. Um, any other final questions? There's a great, um, huge chat. I'm desperately trying to read from Lizzie Simister. Lizzie, I have no idea where you're from. Um, I'm just trying to read it all. Uh, I think it's replying to other queries and it's, yeah, it's, it's making a point about the kind of language and stigmatised approach that's sometimes used. So um, very interesting. Um, Lizzie, do you want to, if you're there, are you able to just uh, summarise that, that comment that you've made and where you're from? Hiya. Um, yeah, sorry. I'm from um, Bolton. Um, uh, and I was just asking, really, because I have a much work with with families um with with not fives and I come from a sort of a nutrition background uh, myself but one of my colleagues Gemma Holdsworth has been doing a lot of work um 
around a, a health at every size approach um, and looking at the, the language and um, weight-based and food-based stigma um, and coming at a, an angle of food uh, neutrality um, and really looking at our language and, and, and how we have these conversations with, with families um, and how it plays into body image and self-esteem and some of the, the wider aspects of, of health and well-being. Um, and I think it's thrown up a, a lot of discussions within in the service and team, because on the one hand, I think we, um, I, I, it's challenged my thinking because I really agree with everything that um, they're saying um, and the impact on families, but also they're trying to move away from even the word healthy weight. Um, and then we're finding it really difficult to, to find other the words to say, um, to talk about weight. Um, so I just wondered what other people um, think of this discussion, just because it's been a bit of a hot topic within our, within our own team and service and what we're trying to do on a, a level individually with, with families um and how that differs from what's happening at a, a higher level really um but yeah I, do, I don't know if it's taking it off on a tangent but i just wondered what people's thoughts were no it's a it's a very relevant question lizzie and discussions that nicola and colder and i uh, have had recently as well the terminology is really important and to avoid stigmatization um would either of the nicolas like to comment on that um i because it's a discussion i've also had with one or two authorities in yorkshire and humber so um e either nicola would would like to address that that query from from lizzie yeah thanks robin and and just to echo your your points um i think it is something that's coming up more and more in discussions and as you said it's something we've had conversations with a number of authorities um who are who are taking this approach now in terms of a, a weight neutral approach um and I, I think it's something we we want to develop our thinking around at Food Active. And we've certainly made reference to this approach in a, a new document that um, we've put together, which kind of summarizes a lot of these prevention frameworks that we've been developing over recent years, um, in, you know, including the local authority declaration, the NHS declaration, and um, the schools pledge that, that Beth and I will, will talk about shortly. Um, and I think it's it's something we, we, we need to consider, but I think that that this approach can work hand in hand with the work around the, the healthy weight declaration. Um, but I think it's a very useful point in terms of um, weight stigma. And again, um, we, we sort of want to develop that thinking and how we can support authorities around uh, reducing weight stigma. Okay, thanks Nicola. And I, I picked up a direct message from Nicola Corrigan to say the internet has dumped her out of this uh, temporarily. I'm hoping Nicola will be able to come back, but uh, 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 hence her not commenting on, the, on that question. Um, uh, I'm going to, I think, hand over to Nicola and Beth in a second. I, I just, uh, again, noting uh, a comment from Paula Cooper in terms of refreshing the commitments, keeping things alive. And, uh, and she makes the quite important point about emphasis again, slightly changing over time to prioritize food poverty. That again is a discussion that I've had very recently with, with Nicola and Beth. This is a live situation. That's the important, I think, of the declaration with things evolving, circumstances evolving, clearly COVID. Um, so I'm I'm going to thank everybody for a number of the questions, realizing this is a, an ongoing discussion as it should be, um, and invite uh, Nicola and Beth, I guess specifically, uh, remember the NHS declaration came in that summer as well. So if you can pick up one or two points about that and very specifically how Food Active can, can help the local authorities that are uh, uh, involved in this call. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks, Robin. Right, just hoping you can see all of this. Is that all okay? Yep.
thrill. Okay, great. So um, thank you everybody for your fantastic presentations this morning and a great uh, Q&A session just there. So me and Nicola just wanted to round off um, today's session by talking about some of our thoughts and ideas on how, um, you know, the Healthy Weight Declaration can be reinvigorated in a COVID recovery era. We've obviously heard some great um, ideas from um, Emma in uh, Gateshead in terms of what their approach has been. Um, so we've designed this to give you a bit of some ideas and some inspiration as well, really. Um, and we really, really would like to invite any local authorities to share their ideas and plans either after the, after the meeting um, directly with me and Nicola or over base camp or some other avenues of communications as well. So um, just we've um, just wanted to quickly run through some of the um, activities we did last summer. So we um, did a refresh of the declaration last year. It was the declaration's fifth birthday, so somehow, um, and we felt there was the need to review the commitments to ensure they were still reflective of the current system. Um, we composed a task and finish group with local authorities at different stages of the adoption process, at, um, early adoption, some a couple of years into adoption, and we identified a number of areas um, and updates and relaunched the declaration last summer. So just gonna quickly run through some of the, what some of these updates were. So some of the commitments were up, increased from 14 to 16. We had a greater emphasis on the role of physical activity and active travel. There was a greater recognition on food insecurity, impact of the food environment. We also made some links with the blue and green infrastructure, climate change and sustainability, uh, focus on partnerships and place-based approaches, recognition of the negative impact on weight stimulus, something that obviously Lizzie just um, brought up there, which is really, really important points. And we've been doing quite a lot of work on, on weight stigma over the last 12 months or so as a result of this um, of weight stigma being included in some of the commitments. And we've also developed a joint narrative with PHE on the whole system's approach to obesity and how they can work together. Um, obviously two really important pieces of work and how they can work in, um, in tangent. Um, so considering all the barriers that public health teams have faced over the last 15 months, we've talked about all of already this morning, the declaration has understandably taken a back seat. And for some, you know, it feels like um, we felt Emma's frustrations earlier, feel like you're starting from scratch, you know, momentum takes such a long time to build and it can be really frustrating when we feel like it's lost. Um, but, you know, for some of the reasons we talked about today, this timing of, you know, the declaration couldn't be actually probably a better timing in terms of the, the COVID um, complications angle, but also that recovery um, and building back better. So here's some of our reflections um, we just wanted to share with you. So like I said, most, if not every single local authority who've been engaged in the process have had to pause due to, due to COVID. So please do not feel like you are alone. Um, capacity for teams have been the biggest issue really. And obviously other really important priorities in terms of emergency response, response has taken priority. Every local authority is different. So no one size fits all. Obviously local authorities are such different sizes across the, across the UK. And um, some of them have greater capacity to, to, to start this piece of work than others. Um, current opportunity and timing to progress this agenda, like I've already mentioned. We're really keen to hear your thoughts and ideas on what we can develop to develop and provide to support you. Obviously, we're in a different position than we were before COVID, and maybe that the, there are gaps in what we currently provide. So we're really keen to learn from you in terms of um, what you think we could provide. But also, we really, really focus on sharing learning um, through our um, base camp platforms, like I've mentioned, through part of the commission. Um, and we really want to make sure that we share that as much as possible with other local authorities who are sort of scra maybe scratching their heads, thinking about what where to start. So um, using the COVID recovery angle is a great way to kind of get the buy-in from for the declaration, whether you know, you're starting out the process or engage, engage midway, or maybe even two years post-adoption. Um, so one of the commitments is also referring to food poverty and insecurity. Um, obviously this is something that Paula Cooper mentioned just previously on the chat. Um, and this is a really, really huge area for a lot of, a lot of areas um, following COVID and the Healthy Work Declaration could be linked um, into this um, through the, the commitments that refer to that, refer to food insecurity. Um, and the Healthy Weight Declaration can also be framed as a tool to help build healthier, more resilient communities in the face of future threats to public health. Hopefully few and far between, but you know, I think we've all got a different way of thinking um, after the last, um, last 15, 15 months. And obviously we know, um, Alison explained this fantastic earlier, healthy weight and inequalities intrinsically, cannot say that word, extrinsically linked. Um, 
And then I think about how we can use the inequalities context to get the Healthy Work Declaration back on the agenda. So obviously we've heard about um, impact to health inequalities. Obviously that term levelling up is something that's thrown around quite a bit um, at the moment in terms of la national government. Um, and I think, you know, the Local Authority Declaration on Healthy Weight is all about taking the focus off the individual and working to improve the wider terms of healthy weight. So we can really focus it around supporting communities, you know, supporting them with an environment that is conducive to healthy lifestyle um, behaviours. Um, and the local the declaration can also help to address some of the social um, and environmental um, determinants of health. Um, it also supports, supports whole systems thinking and place-based approach. And, you know, obviously, finally, any action to promote healthy weight decreases the life of, um, you know, lots of different non-communicable diseases, um, which can help promote increased life expectancy and greater years lived in good, good health. So it's all about supporting our communities, giving them a better environment to promote um, healthy weight. I'm just going to hand over to Nicola to take you through the last few slides. So just quickly wanted to um, remind you of uh, some of the uh, existing resources that we do have to support local authorities, um, whether that's new authorities or authorities that are looking to uh, reinstate their work associated with the Healthy Weight Declaration. So a good place to start for those that are new to the Healthy Weight Declaration may be the action planning and monitoring tool. And this can help to provide an opportunity to benchmark current activity associated with healthy weight and perhaps consider some small yet achievable first steps and that might be around uh, engagement it might be around building support and momentum and we appreciate that's a, an element of the, the process that does take time and um, we have the healthy weight declaration support pack which offers a step-by-step -step guide to adoption um, and this is particularly helpful when considering where to start and uh, a stepwise approach to implementation, because we appreciate that it can feel a little bit uh, overwhelming at times and it's, it's helpful to break down the steps in the process. Next slide, please, Beth. So for authorities that are looking to reinstate this work and build momentum again, it may be helpful to revisit some of the original steering groups or working groups or reviewing stakeholder membership, um, particularly in light of recent and ongoing structural changes across the public health landscape and with the development of the PCN networks and the new ICS structures, it's good to consider who those stakeholders might be. And also take account of capacity um, of some of our local authority officers in the context of COVID. So thinking about what we can do in the short term and perhaps combining this with a review of progress or activity, uh, utilising the Healthy Weight Declaration Audit and Validation Tool. Next slide, please. In addition, um, just one or two other resources to reference, we do have a COVID-19 elected member briefing, which is a good conversation starter um, with elected members and a good way to look to identify your Healthy Weight Declaration political champions and engage new elected members or officers, um, particularly following local elections. We have the Healthy Weight Declaration Impact and Influence Report, and this demonstrates the impact that the Healthy Weight Declaration can have um, and the approach used by different authorities and includes a range of case studies. And then it may be helpful to also consider staff and community awareness. So think about utilising some of the communication assets that we have available um, to raise the profile of the Healthy Weight Declaration with staff and local communities. Next slide, please, Beth. And again, just a reminder that we do have um, the Healthy Weight Declaration Resource Hub, which is available for commissioning authorities. Um, you can find login details for that on Basecamp or do get in touch with one of the teams should you um, need those details or further information. Next slide, please, Beth. So just very quickly in terms of what's next, um, the Healthy Weight Declaration is a constantly evolving piece of work. So we have been developing one or two new resources. Um, the Pledge for a Healthy and Active Future is our school's Healthy Weight Declaration. This is currently being piloted um, with colleagues in Leeds. Um, we're due to evaluate this at the end of the summer and um, with a view to making this widely available from September. As many of you know, we've been piloting an NHS Healthy Weight Declaration 
in the southwest of England. This has now been evaluated and we're looking to launch phase two of delivery in coming weeks to support adoption with further trusts across the southwest. And currently uh, in the process of thinking through again how we make this available to um, other authorities and uh, NHS organisations outside of the southwest region. So please please do contact me if you'd like more information about that. And finally, just to mention the Healthy Weight Declaration webinar series and our weight stigma resources. And um, these are something that we plan to continue to develop um, over the course of the next 12 months. Um, and we hope to share further information via the Food Active newsletter. Next slide, please, Beth. So again, just a little bit of information about the Food Active team. Um, please do get in contact with us um, should you need further information following today. Um, I know we're now coming to the end of the session. We've run over slightly. So I think I will... Um, just conclude with my duties as a chair and really to thank all of our speakers this morning for their contributions and, and hard work, really in pioneering the Healthy Weight Declaration in, in their own areas and in their own unique ways. Um, and thank you for their time uh, in delivering their presentations this morning. And thanks very much for everybody for joining us. We really do hope you found it useful. Thank you for your contributions in the chat. I think as ever we've learned, we perhaps don't find uh, enough time for the discussion. So that's certainly something for us to consider with, with future events. And I know Beth will be sharing uh, a survey for you to offer your feedback. Um, so once again, thank you to all our speakers. Please do get in touch if you'd like more information and I um, hope you have a good, good rest of the day and thanks for joining. Thank you. <laughs> See you all soon.